Hello and welcome to this uh, afternoon session that we call Nordic Excellence in Sustainable Healthcare. My name is Felicia Max Vanneheid and I work at uh, Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare and I will be moderating the session today. So before we begin, I would like to go through a few practical details. As a participant, you can ask questions to the speakers by writing them in the chat and the speakers will uh, answer those after their presentations. Uh, this session will focus on why and in what way the Nordic countries are prominent in the field of sustainable healthcare. Uh, and we're also going to hear two concrete examples of sustainable healthcare from the central region of Denmark and the capital region of Denmark. So I'm not going to speak much longer, but I'm going to hand over this, uh, the screen to Maria Gaden, who works at the central uh, region of Denmark. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Felicia, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I will just share my slides. And yes, my name is Maria Gern, and I'm a chief project manager working at the central Denmark region, where I work with the broad area of sustainable healthcare within our hospitals. Before I move on, I would like to explain the title of my talk here, being Sustainability in and as Center of our Clinical Practice. That's me, you see in the picture. I have 10 years of experience as a clinician, as a midwife. And it seems to me that sustainability has always been part of the DNA of our healthcare system. We were, so to speak, born and raised as clinicians to work uh, in a sustainable way. We do not just fix a broken leg in a random kind of way. We actually spend hours and millions of dollars or euros on examining how to do it in a sustainable way. How do we fix the health problems of the people in a way that will last and that will not cause any new health issues? So what's happening here and what seems to have been a problem so far is that the perspective has been too narrow. Uh, we have as clinician been brought up to look into the body of the patient as the only ecosystem uh, from which the health of a person actually depends. And as WHO is pointing out uh, these days, the biggest challenge of people's health in the 21st century is actually the climate change. So we need to change our perspective and not just look into the health and well being of the body, of the narrow ecosystem. We need to see it in a larger perspective. If we look into how uh, the healthcare system in the central Denmark region seems to affect the climate, this is our emissions in 2019. We see here that the goods and services is 70% is, is of our CO2 emission, which is quite a lot. We produce 7,000 tons of waste per year. Only 20% is right now being recycled. If we look into the details of the CO2 emission, we can see that the clinical equipment, the medicine, the medtech and the services is what stands for uh, by far the largest part of the emission. We are right now waiting for the final political improvement of our regional strategy for sustainability. Uh, it is a quite ambitious strategy and we are proud and we are also excited. Uh, it says that by 2030, uh, we will have reached a 70% reduction of our CO2 emission. We will have a recycling percentage of 70. Right now it was 20. And we will have 30% reduction of our waste production. And then there are some goals and visions within the area of uh, CSR as well. So if we look into how do we then create this reduction of both CO2 and waste amount, uh, the circular economy is, of course, the theory behind uh, and the vision lying ahead of us. Here it is expressed in the zero waste uh, symbol from the European Union. Uh, what really matters is uh, to focus right now on how to make the biggest difference. And that would be in reducing uh, our consumption. 
there seems to be among the clinicians uh, a focus on recycling. The plastic waste is really what fills up uh, the mines, um, and that goes for the hospital healthcare sector. And I believe that's also uh, something that's going on in society in general, that this recycling issue is really uh, taking a lot of our energy. And that's fine. Uh, this, when we're talking about the transition into circular economy, it's not an either or question, it's both and. That goes for the healthcare uh, sector as well. But the plastic packaging of our medical stuff is typically standing for around 5 to 10% of the CO2 footprint. So, what we need to look into is the prevention of uh, using stuff. Um, uh, politics is, uh, of course, important here. Uh, we need to spend a lot more money and time in preventing diseases from happening. We need to look into the procurement area. Do we buy the right stuff that actually invites us to use less and where we do also gain the 5-10% from the packaging? We need to get everything on board. And then we need to look into the people, into their behavior. And that is what I will be focusing on today. This picture illustrates a Danish saying that uh, is to stick your finger into the ground. And that means that before you plant something, you need to examine the ground that you're planting in. You need to know what kind of fertilization, what kind of watering is needed here in order to make your seed blossom and grow for the full potential. When I started in this job and wanted to work with the reducing of our consumption within the, the hospitals, the first thing I did was to put my finger in the ground in a way where I went out, interviewed a lot of uh, clinicians, leaders, hospital CEOs, patients, and so on to find out what was really uh, their view upon this uh, reducement of uh, uh, consumption and on sustainability uh, in general. It was quite clear that no matter where in our organization people were positioned, the, the motivation of working with this area was really high. This is from a nurse expressing that he really wanted to do something, but he did not know how. Here we have a department nurse saying that really she was truly motivated, but this was the resources that was a problem. They could not find the time and they did not have the money to actually let some of their clinicians uh, dive into uh, the problems that uh, that was uh, there when they talked about their procurement, sorry, consumption. Here we have a facility coordinator uh, expressing that the social support and the culture was really important as well. There was a lack of social um, arenas where this was actually the topic that we were talking about. It could sometimes be seen as unserious if you as a doctor or a nurse brought up this topic in, in, in a meeting where you were talking about types of operation or coordination between different professional areas. If you suddenly started talking about sustainability, it didn't really fit in. So these, uh, these interviews and the data that was collected uh, made it clear that they were, there were like three main areas that was uh, uh, that was needed to be supported in order to make these seeds grow because the seeds were there they were perfectly motivated to to make uh, a change in their way of uh, practicing um, but they did not know exactly where to start they had no knowledge as to should they choose a single use item or multiple use items uh, they did not know how to find the money how to find the time and they did not know who to talk to so what we did in 2019 in the clinical scene uh, was to start up a network for all employees and all leaders in the region. We had two meetings in 2019. The corona made it hard for us to have any meetings here in 2020, but we're having one in two weeks as well. There's been around 100 people each time, and it's been leaders, employees, all professions, all units has actually been represented. So that's really good. We have made some test labs. I will get back to those uh, in a minute. We made microfunding possible to, uh, for each department to apply for microfunding to uh, let their employees uh, get time uh, at, in the working hours to actually look into these areas. And we have now 25 projects running 
not all of them are concerning a re reducement of consumption. Some of them are also uh, within the construction area, but, uh, but the major part of them is actually clinical projects looking into the consumption of goods and services. And then we are hopefully launching an online platform in a few months uh, where knowledge sharing and inspiration and networking will be possible. They are really craving for this online solution, uh, the clinician out there. So that's, that's exciting. Now I'll give you some example of these microfunding projects. I have skipped out all of the projects looking into plastic cups and plastic uh, plates and forks. That's really something that has uh, filled a lot, but uh, it's on a rather small scale. So I've founded some of the projects uh, which expresses this change in the clinical perspective that I started out by uh, presenting. We have a women's department in one of our smaller hospitals uh, who has been looking into a number of things. Now, these are two uh, important examples, I think, because they are really dealing with the hygiene issues. They have removed all the bed covering paper from the consultation room. The patients have actually objected. <laughs> they had to put up signs explaining why did they do this, and this was actually okay also during the corona, because to be honest, it's more cultural that it's actually functional. If there are body fluids, of course, a bed covering paper with plastic on the back stops the fluids from actually being absorbed by the mattress, which by the way is liquid proof, but okay, it has a function. If you're just lying on uh, the bed to get your blood pressure measured, whatever, it has no function. You're touching the side of the bed while you climb up and while you climb down, it is, does not prevent infection from spreading. Um, and the hygiene nurses, um, and consultants uh, accepted this solution. And right now they're wiping off the bed with uh, an, in, an environmental friendly soap and water. And that is just as effective and it's far more sustainable. They are reusing the blister packs for birth induction pills from patients to patients. They disinfect the blister pack. The pill is still sterile. It is perfectly legal. It is perfectly hygienic um, and they think they might save up to five to ten percent of the pills per year it's really hard to tell because more and more births are being induced we have an it administration department who's just started out a project where they want to look into the labels now that may seem like a small thing in a hospitalization but still we have in central denmark region region uh, we are treating six hundred and ten thousand patients per year now, some of them will definitely show up more than once, but let's, let's just say that for each of these 610 patients, we print out a piece of labels. Each paper with labels on contains 32 labels. Now, they are never being used, all of them. That is their thesis, and I believe it's true. Maybe they did in the old days, but we don't do that anymore. Digitalization is uh, all over. But if we do print 32 labels for each patient that we treat in the central Denmark region, that is 19 million labels per year. That's a lot. And it's not possible to recycle it because of the glue on the backside. Again, it's a may maybe a small thing. I don't know if we can measure it in our uh, CO2 uh, emissions for next year, but culturally, if we're talking the behavior and the people uh, within our organization, it's important to state that we do not use things. We do not consume anything in the healthcare sector that makes no sense, sense in regard to the health of the patients. So let's see what they found out. If we can digitalize everything, or maybe could it be possible to print just one label? We'll see. The anesthesia, we have two different departments with each, each their project. One of them is a superior doctor who wants to look into the use of oxygen in operations, only the non-acute. Right now, it is normal to use 100% oxygen, no matter if you are a young woman, man, or if you are an elderly, asthmatic person, everyone just get 100% of oxygen. Actually, the evidence shows that that is not the best solution. It can cause problems to get too much oxygen. But it's a cultural thing to, to be better safe than sorry, to always rate up the highest. Uh, so he wants to actually 
target that uh, cultural aspect of his own profession and say, can we actually adapt uh, the amount of oxygen that we're using for our patients? They also want to see if we can reuse some of the tubes from all of the masks. There are filters in, makes it very hard for bacteria to travel across the filters, but we are changing several of meters of tubes for each patient. So these are all examples of uh, how we are trying to question the clinical practice uh, in the perspective of sustainability. This is a test lab that we made on Rana's Regional Hospital. Uh, it started two and a half year ago where we started co cooperating with the Nordic Ecolabel. And they've also given a talk today, I know. Um, and it was an excellent cooperation because it was the first time that they tried to certify anything within a hospital setting. They have certified uh, other areas, other services, also cleaning services, but not within a hospital setting. The things we went through was all the dots you can see here, um, looking into our consumption, um, taking a lot of dialogues with the uh, with the employees in the service department on how did they actually dosage the chemicals, how did they uh, use uh, the the bin bags, and uh, we had our laundry services as well uh, as well uh, receiving the eco label. Uh, so we knew that that was optimized uh, in a sustainable way. And one of the things that really um, grew upon the employees was this talk about the bin bags. And it spread out to other areas as well, but we'll use it as an example. Uh, you can see in the picture 25 waste bins with bags that weighs close to nothing, because that's what people say. It was seven grams, I think, each plastic bags. This department actually moved all these bins, and that was 43 kilos of plastic in a year. Now, I was hoping that when we did this certification, this would spread out. Uh, we tried to spread it out, and that maybe we would be able to see within a year that our consumption of bags had changed in a significant way. And it did. It actually turned out that from May 2019 to January 2020, the consumption all over the hospital uh, was reduced with uh, 16%. That's 2.4 tons of plastic annually. And this is one of the smallest hospitals in the region. The consumption of cleaning products was reduced with 14.5%. Now that is not only saving us CO2 and chemicals, it's also saving us money, which we can spend to make more sustainable changes. The eco-labeling cleaning products went from 50 to 16% up to 100%. And here the procurement department, of course, was a great help and support. Uh, and in June, we had actually the first uh, hospital holding the certification with the eco-label of their internal cleaning services. So what, what was the reason why this actually worked uh, within a year of uh, dialogue with uh, all the employees? I think that, first of all, there was a leadership support. It's extremely important if we want to make these changes that the leaders of the department support the prioritization of asking the right question of trying out new habits. It's important as well that there's a high uh, level of trust. And the Nordic Swan Eco Label is a very familiar uh, label to most uh, Nordic people. So people had trust that this would make a difference. And um, yeah, we'll see where it takes us. We are, of course, considering uh, spreading this out to all of our hospitals, uh, getting the benefits from there. The second test labs I want to produce you is from the operation, operational ward, where we have made two tracks. Uh, one we call the curious consumptionists, and one of them, the next we call trash test dummies. I think the name reveals what they're looking into. And we are working in both groups with baseline data evidence and the observation of their own culture. And this has actually grown from just being one operational ward that wanted to be curious on their own consumption to being regional where all operational wards are uh, contributing with uh, data from their departments. Because what we're doing with the curious consumption is, is that we've been weighing a lot of waste from the operational wards. Here we see the numbers from two of our hospitals. The corona has delayed the process a lot. I'm waiting from data which is currently being made from the other hospitals. But as you can see here, 
they have uh, quite precisely found different uh, types of operation and weighing the waist. And we can see it differs quite a lot, especially within the shoulder and the laparoscopic gal um, and the foot operations. So when we have the results from all five hospital units, we have a, a workshop where we want to uh, make them even more curious. How do they actually observe their own profession in a constructive, innovative way? Uh, we will have a working group uh, traveling around the hospitals, being curious as to how can everyone at least get to the lowest baseline of waste production and how can we maybe all of us get a little bit lower. That's the target of the project. The trash test dummies at the operational wards have been looking into waste sorting as well. As I said, we were only on 20% and we need to improve. So we started looking into plastic. Now, what you see on these posters are not plastic molecules that has been illustrated by the side. It is actually elements of a playground. Because this is part of a partnership uh, with a lot of external partners where we are trying to examine if we can make local circular uh, flows of materials from a hospital to the local society, supporting innovation and good entrepreneurship. So here we are trying to collect plastic from a hospital and then building a playground to promote health for kids and their parents in the city. Now, maybe this is not where all our plastic needs to go in the future, but it's a really interesting project mm -hmm. since we are having our plastic uh, quality tested uh, in a very exact way, because that's what uh, playground producers do. Kids are going to touch it and I don't know what they, they lick their fingers and stuff. So it's a really accurate test that we are having made for the plastic quality. So hopefully during this fall, we will build the play playground and we will know a lot more about our plastic quality. We do know something about our plastic quality as well. This is numbers from uh, my good colleague, Suzanne Bagas project running at Aarhus University Hospital in 2016. Some of you might know it. What it shows that is really interesting is that we still have about 40% of our plastic that is unknown plastic types. A lot of it is not possible to recycle but some of it is. So that's what we are trying to do with the trash test dummies. So with these data, uh, I want to finish up saying that we know that we cannot do this alone. We are really happy to be part of this Nordic collaboration. And we are looking into European collaboration as well as a potential area of moving some of these fields because uh, we, we need to make this uh, systemic change uh, together, definitely. And I will finish up by giving an invitation to an international living lab that we're making uh, together with the northern and the southern Denmark region and the capital region will join us as well. And the energy cluster of Denmark, where we'll look into uh, two main challenges, the energy consumption and the resource consumption. I will not go into details, but it will be on the 24th of September. It's online. And anyone who is interested in this area or SMEs who have something to offer are free to join. So you can check out uh, this link if you are curious. That would be my final remarks, I think. So I'll just see if there has been any comments or questions. <laughs> yeah, someone writes that no bed covering paper is really simple. Just challenge the tradition. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Um, but it is, as I said, only part of it. The procurement, the politics, everything needs to work together with the people. Perfect. Thank you very much, Maria. So if you uh, have any questions that you think of a little bit later, you can just write them in the chat and we can come back to it at the end of the session if we have some time. Great. So uh, we are going to move on in the program. So I want to introduce our next speaker, which is Ole Gana Jakobsen from the capital region of Denmark. Welcome. I will go ahead and share your screen. Thanks a lot, Felicia. And thanks to you, uh, Daniel and the Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare and DTU for making this event in spite of the Corona crisis. It's really a good job you are doing. And hi to you out there. Uh, I hope you are not uh, asleep. It's uh, quite late, but I'll try to uh, keep you awake. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, climate action and uh, leadership 
in the capital region of uh, Denmark. And I think my presentation will work very well together with uh, Maria's talk about what they're doing in, in, the, in Jutland. In the capital region, uh, uh, this uh, green transition is, is in our vision. It's a green and innovative metropolis with growth and high quality of life with cutting edge green solutions and a health service that meets the very best international standard. Uh, th these are some uh, photos from uh, this. The first one is from Copenhagen with all the bicycles. It's quite funny. Uh, and actually more people are using the bicycle to get from, uh, from job or, or studies in Copenhagen than by car. And of course, you know, the, the, the windmills and uh, organic food is, is, is a very big issue, not only in Denmark, but also in the capital region of the kitchens. I'll talk more about that later. Well, uh, Paul uh, from uh, region Zealand talked about the regional Denmark, so I'll not spend a lot of time on that. I'll just add that we not only uh, operate and develop the healthcare sector, we also work with the regional development in the region as a geographical area. And there we work with the uh, environment, for example, uh, protection of uh, groundwater and uh, contaminated soil, public transportation, research and innovation, education, culture and tourism. And sometimes it works very well together with our work at, at, at the hospitals with, because there are some uh, synergies uh, between between the, 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 the areas. Capital region of Denmark, it's uh, quite small uh, in square kilometers, but uh, uh, measured in citizens, it's uh, for Danish standard uh, quite big. <laughs> we are nearly uh, two million uh, citizens. Um, there are seven uh, hospitals. Uh, actually, there are a lot more units, but there are six, seven hospitals from a management uh, point of view. And we are, again, again for a Danish standard, we are a huge, uh, huge uh, organization with about uh, 40,000 uh, employees. The larger perspective, some other speakers have uh, talked about that, so I'll not use a lot of time on that. Uh, another sp uh, speaker talked about uh, the global uh, carbon emission from the healthcare sector is estimated to around uh, 5%, but in the European countries, it's estimated to be uh, between 5% and 15%. So it's, 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 uh, it could be a lot, a lot more than 5% for some countries. And it's, it's not only from uh, the traditional areas we measure like energy consumption and uh, transportation, but uh, the major part of this uh, carbon emission is from uh, embedded uh, carbon in all the products we we buy and the buildings we we, we construct. Uh, other speakers has also talked about that. Uh, measured in GDP, uh, it's uh, it's a, a huge. Also, uh, it's about ten percent of the glo glo global or in the European uh, the GDP is spent on the healthcare sector, and this is only going one way. That's up the coming years because of the demographic uh, situation we are facing and the, 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 the um, how to say the treatments which are getting more, more and more complicated. Our approach in the capital region has been for some years uh, long-term uh, corporate programs. It started with the thing we call a green operation and development in 2016. Uh, where we had uh, three areas of action in it, uh, energy, transportation, and, uh, and waste resources. And uh, it had, uh, we made three uh, action plans, strategic action, action plans for reductions goals in, in 2025 and, uh, and actions. And uh, last year, the, the, um, the council, the, the regional council uh, uh, approved this uh, action plan for UN's uh, uh, development goals. And it has a broad focus on uh, health uh, and social social and green transition, not only not only green transition and, uh, and uh, environmental sustainability, but also a focus on uh, social and health uh, sustainability. And in the health area, the focus areas are uh, equality in health. That's a big problem. And the other area is uh, prevention 
we can do a lot better on prevention of uh, diseases. And actually, there's a lot of sustainability in preventing uh, people from getting ill. <clears throat> and this uh, broader SDG action plan, uh, 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 a consequence of that, uh, then we, we uh, re renewed uh, this uh, climate program. We made it broader, more, ambi more ambitious. And with instead of uh, goals for 25, we made goals for, uh, for 30, 20, 2030. Um, and what is this uh, program concept? I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that now. Um, it has uh, five elements. The first uh, area is uh, the areas of action. And that's like the core of the program. That's, as I said, uh, energy, waste, resources, transportation. And there are three new, uh, new uh, areas of action as a consequence of the, the UN development plan. It's uh, organic and climate-friendly food. There's a huge uh, climate uh, footprint from uh, an environmental footprint from all the food we are consuming at the hospitals and uh, wastewater. Again, a lot, we have uh, quite a, a nasty uh, waste, wastewater coming out from the hospitals. So wastewater is, is an area and uh, sustainable buildings. We have, uh, as I said, uh, goals for 2030. We have uh, strategic action plans for the uh, three first areas. And we are going to make uh, strategic action plans, long-term action plans for the last uh, last uh, three areas. Then we have uh, supporting, yeah. So supporting areas is uh, green procurement, of course, and actually it both a uh, supporting area and an area of action. Of course, around as uh, previous uh, present census has said about it, perhaps 80 and 90 percent of the carbon emission is coming from all the stuff we buy and the buildings we, we construct. Uh, partnership and innovation is very important. If we want to succeed with green transition, uh, innovation is, is not, uh, it's not it's something we just have to do. And partnership with uh, the private sector and authorities is essential. Communication and dissemination is very important because some areas perhaps you can uh, you can do uh, technical uh, fixes like the energy area, but as Maria talked about uh, uh, circular economy, you, you, you need like the whole organization, the whole staff actually somehow to be involved. The same with green transportation, green food. So it, it's uh, very much a communication uh, challenge and dissemination of, uh, of information. The third area is governance, uh, uh, governance structure. Uh, we are a big organization. Generally, health systems are complicated. Uh, so we, 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 need a, we need a governance structure. How do we make decisions from the top of the organization down the, the middle management and, and, and further down? And also a kind of structure for how do we uh, how do we uh, coordinate? How do we share information? That's extremely important. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Economy and financing, of course, without without uh, financing, uh, we cannot uh, do a lot. Uh, and there's an important uh, point about that because energy, uh, Lars from Siemens talked about how much uh, savings you can do from energy efficiency uh, projects. So for us, it's very important to see these uh, areas of action as a whole, because the rest of the areas, it basically costs some money to, to, to make the transition. Like Maria said, some areas you, you, can, you can save money in circular economy, but to make the whole, uh, the things are rolling, uh, it, it, you, you need investments. So energy is, is a good area to, 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 to make savings you can use on, uh, on the other areas and actually, Friday, our regional council made the budget for, for, for next year and they approved a system where we put we put a kind of internal tax on flights and then this tax we, we use for, for, for green procurement. So it, it, it has been difficult really to move on a, on a green procurement because a, a measure for success is low prices. But with this kind of new new funding, we hope to, to, to perform uh, better on that. 
The last area is a management system because it's very easy to make plans and strategies and everything, but uh, the devil is in the implementation. So this uh, management system is actually quite simple. We have made a kind of adjusted system for, for the capital region. It's not like a certified system, but it works quite well for us, I think. And it's uh, like the traditional plan, do, check, act uh, elements. And uh, we do annual action plans, uh, uh, operational plans. Uh, what do we do the next year? Roles, who do it? Uh, where do we get the money from? And what's the success crit uh, criteria? Then we do it. And uh, after a year, we, uh, we have our climate account where we see how, how does it go with the carbon reduction, the, the waste uh, percent of recycling, energy consumption, and so on. And if there are deviations, if something is not like it should be, then we, 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 we do adjustments and we present it for the, for the top, top uh, management and the politicians. And uh, we try to do the necessary uh, adjustments. And actually, this management system, I think, is, is quite important to show that we are we are on the right, right track, where we're not performing okay, and where do we have to, to adjust adjust our actions. So this was a little bit about the content and, and the structure of uh, how we are approaching uh, approach, approaching things. Well, a, a few cases. One is uh, the area Maria talked about. Uh, waste management and circular economy. The first step for us in the capital region is to try to increase uh, the amount of uh, waste we actually recycle. We are <laughs> only at, at uh, about 20, 20% and we have been around that for, for several years. It's difficult to increase, but we have made a kind of corporate uh, action where all the other hospitals are implementing this uh, system we see on the right at the clinics and the different uh, departments uh, separation in 10 different uh, fractions. It's a rollout uh, in the whole organization. And uh, this is where we, for example, where the governance structure is very important for, for the, the, the solid waste area because lots of different professional uh, fields are involved. Lots of different departments uh, in the organization is involved. Uh, but with this system, we hope to increase our uh, recycling uh, percentage. Um, and this, is, uh, this shows a roadmap for getting uh, to waste-free hospitals. You can see uh, to the left uh, the, the development from uh, our baseline to uh, the last uh, eight, 2080 and 2090. It's about the same, same uh, number. So we have quite a challenge to reach our recycling from 20% to 40%. And our, our mission goal for 30, 2035 is uh, that we have to be waste-free. We have a lot of, a lot of work uh, in front of us. And also we need to have a lot better frame uh, conditions, uh, products uh, designed for circularity, uh, longer lifetime and so on. We cannot do it alone. We need authorities and EU and everybody to work together. And again, partnership is a very important uh, element of our efforts. Uh, we have a partnership in the area of uh, circular textiles with other regions and uh, the European Union. We have a partnership uh, dealing with uh, plastic. We have exactly the same problem as, as Maria and I think uh, most other organizations in, in the whole world actually to so solve the, the plastic uh, challenge. Another case is uh, energy. Uh, this is uh, actually last talked about the solar panel at the uh, Vidor Hospital. I didn't know it was actually the largest in, uh, in Scandinavia, and I remember that. Uh, but uh, at the left, you see a huge um, a part for, 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 for use, reuse, reuse of uh, heat in the ventilation system at Herlev Hospital. That's the, the, the biggest project in Denmark of that kind. And uh, the roadmap for fossil free and energy efficient hospitals is like this. Uh, you can see the from our baseline year to 2080 and 2090, we are going the right direction towards our goal. 
And that's uh, mainly because we have a supply, energy supply in Denmark, which is uh, making the green tra tra uh, transition uh, quite fast. Actually, our energy consumption in the capital region has been, uh, electricity and heat has been about the same since, since the baseline. That sounds quite disappointing. But uh, at the same time, our production has increased about uh, 16%. And uh, we have we we have lots of uh, equipment which use uh, more and more energy because of the treatments are getting more advanced. And um, last talked about the uh, the energy saving uh, project at the uh, at the uh, Vidor Hospital. We have had uh, several more big uh, projects, and now actually uh, we are going to implement a huge uh, energy saving uh, program for about 140 million euro. Uh, it's, uh, we have actually detected where we can save energy. And for the next uh, three years, we're going to implement it. And that, that should help us to, to save about approximately 15% of our energy consumption. That's a very huge uh, project. And we are looking very much forward to see it actually implemented. Again, partnership is uh, crucial. Uh, as you know, the, the, the energy system is getting more and more uh, renewable energy, which depends on the weather. So big, big energy uh, cons cons consumption companies like the hospitals needs to have a, a, a smart energy consumption, which match the energy production. Uh, so that's that, that we, we are in a EU uh, uh, project to see how we can contribute to smart energy uh, uh, consumption system. All this, is it easy? <laughs> no, it's very complicated. Is it without challenges? No. Here I have uh, five of uh, uh, the, the normal uh, challenges every practitioner of, uh, of green transition uh, knows. Uh, lack of holistic approaches constant competition of limited financial and human resources, organizational silos, skepticism to changes, sustainable, still not considered a core service. I'll not talk a lot about that, but you know it, and it's a fact, it's a challenge. Uh, and actually, what can we do about it? That's a big uh, issue. And the important thing when you talk about green transition and development uh, as such, it's important that we see it as uh, actually uh, organizational development. We should see it as change management and we should nurse change agents, uh, change practitioners very much because without uh, these, this, uh, these, these things, uh, we're not uh, going to succeed with the green transition. And in my point of view, there's one factor which is uh, by far the most important, and that is leadership and uh, people. And I have tried to make five things I think is important. Yeah, leadership is uh, the one thing which is important. And um, oh. meaningful vision is uh, it's very important, a direction. Where do we want to go? A purpose to engage people in, in this uh, journey we are we're going through. Maria talked about trust and uh, in, in collaboration with other people to make changes. I think trust is, is, is the most important uh, thing to, to a kind of nurse and to, um, to think about. Courage. Uh, Changes are not without controversies, conflicts, uh, different, uh, um, how do you say, different things you want. So without a courage to take these uh, conflicts, controversies, we are not, uh, we are not going to succeed. Persistence, uh, this is a long-term uh, project. It's not fixed uh, today or tomorrow or in two years, uh, in five years. It's, uh, it's a big challenge and flexibility. In Danish, we have this word, uh, there are many ways to roam. And some, sometimes uh, one way you want to go one way, it's not possible. And um, we must find uh, 
other ways. And talking about leadership, uh, first, this, this, these are people from my organization at the top, politicians and top management. And uh, there are, they are people from a hospital director, a top, uh, a top uh, management uh, person and two politicians. In the center, four, four middle managers from a hospital kitchen, uh, from a resource hospital in Copenhagen. At the bottom, there's a staff from the kitchen in, uh, at a Hilo hospital and three uh, nurses uh, who won uh, our environmental prize last year. They, they, they work very hard to, to, with the circular economy. And I, this arrow uh, top down, that's how we often think about leadership, that we have uh, many top management polit politicians. If it's a political organization, they make the decisions, they point out the direction. Uh, but uh, with this with this approach uh, and uh, with this approach to leadership, we are not going to succeed. So I try to make a, a drawing here where, where it's, uh, and I have put the upside down where we have the staff at the top and the management, top management and politicians at the bottom because uh, leadership is not only taking place uh, at the top, but that's at all levels. Maria talked about the staff who wants to wants changes. So uh, I think the big challenge is how actually to uh, make this happen um, a more dynamic organization uh, where we focus on uh, leadership at all levels. Uh, we, we, we nurse uh, change agents, uh, change practitioners, try to make them them better networking sharing and scaling of good ideas uh, informers sharing etc and the case is uh, organic uh, and climate friendly food that's very much a bottom up initiative um, where staff in the kitchen uh, wondered why do we throw out such a lot of uh, organic waste that's a waste of uh, money that's bad for the environment and so on so th they work hard on it uh, we have organic food that's more like some politicians have uh, talked about that uh, and we have local produced food that's also middle managers uh, agenda we have uh, recycling of food and uh, lots of other areas so how do we how do we make organization which are better to 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 use all this all these good ideas and actually make them uh, happen? Uh, that's 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 a important challenge. And talking about leadership, uh, there was this big uh, demonstration in Copenhagen uh, Saturday, uh, close to where I lived, and I saw these uh, these young girls uh, with all their their posters. And I think this is really what uh, leadership is about, to so step forward and uh, take in initiative. Sorry. These are actually beautiful change agents. And actually, in a few years, they are going to work at the hospitals. And I'm sure these, these, these people, they want to see action. And they will want to, to really see, want to see things happen. Uh, but they are young now. Now we, are, we, have, we have an important... Uh, uh, task to, to, to do because we are the ones who can make changes. These are girls that will take about uh, 20 years before they are in positions where they actually can make changes at the healthcare system or whenever. So that was my uh, talk. If there are any questions. Thank you very much, Ola. Let's see if there is any questions. Peter Kelly has a little comment here. Very exciting program. Well done. Great. Yeah, I think we are going to move the program forward. If there will be any more questions later on, uh, we can get back to that in the end of the session. So I would like to present our next speaker, Anna Rydby, who is the Regional Director of SWE Care Foundation in Stockholm. Hello, Anna. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you see me? Yeah. Yes. And Great. hear you. Okay. That's also important. So, well, being among the last speakers in 
a long uh, but very interesting day and i think everyone has already said a lot of interesting and uh, things so i'll probably be repeating what others have already said but that might be fine so my name is Anna Ribi and I'm a regional director at the uh, Sweet Care Foundation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we can share uh, the Nordic sustainable healthcare globally, but first just a few words about uh, Sweet Care, uh, my organization. So we are a semi-governmental foundation and we want to contribute to the de development of sustainable and resilient healthcare globally by promoting exports and uh, international collaboration uh, regarding Swedish innovations and solutions. And we do this by creating uh, platforms for public and private uh, decision makers, for academia and industry to meet and uh, exchange views and to, uh, well, showcase their solutions. And this can be done, for example, through delegation trips with uh, political representation. Uh, we also receive incoming delegations and we um, have a lot of uh, knowledge uh, sharing seminars and so on and uh, participate in various projects from time to time. And um, these are our members. There are more than 100 um, from the small startups to the largest uh, medtech companies and pharmaceutical companies in Sweden like AstraZeneca and uh, Gettinge and uh, Karolinska, for example, is an academic institute. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, Nordic healthcare. So first, just a few basic facts. Uh, we differ a bit when it comes to population with Iceland being the small one and Sweden the, the biggest one. But let's face it, 10 million, that's not really very big. It's not even the size of a medium sized um, Chinese city. So we're small. On the other hand, we're rather rich compared to, to the global average anyway. And Norway's, Norway, of course, is the, the leader in this aspect. Uh, we're all really urbanized uh, with more than 80% living in urban areas. And uh, we have a high fertility rate compared to, to Europe, and especially Southern Europe. Um, but we have a growing proportion of elderly above 65, that's approximately 20%, except Iceland, which is the, the youngest country among uh, the Nordic ones. So we'll also have a high life expectancy. And maybe because of that, we also spend a lot of resources and a share of GDP on healthcare, approximately 10%. And that often i mean high spending on healthcare is often uh, correlated with uh, high emissions from the healthcare sector but um, as as a percentage of the national total emissions but actually the nordic countries don't the healthcare sector is uh, more or less the the global average even though we do have a larger healthcare sector so i guess that our healthcare uh, has a little bit less environmental impact than in many other countries. And also talking about the Nordics, I think we should consider culture, politics and legislation. So we were a rural society not that long ago, maybe just uh, two, three, four generations ago. And nature is very important. I heard someone talking earlier about uh, bibliophilia, biophilia. Um, so the, the love for, for nature. Uh, and when it comes to politics, we have the heritage of the Nordic welfare state and the social democratic values of uh, equity and uh, the, that the state should be uh, provide for its citizens. And we also have a strict legislation when it comes to, to um, well, environmental issues, among other things. Um, <clears throat> and this, um, especially healthcare, is also seen as a... Um, an activity which can cause harm to the environment. So uh, there are special uh, legislation for the healthcare sector. And uh, looking at the health systems in the Nordics, we have a few, um, well, I guess many common characteristics and I just wanted to go through uh, some of them. So as I already mentioned, uh, the equality and equity perspective uh, based in the well, Nordic welfare model, 
So the healthcare should be needs-based and not according to your ability to pay. And it should be accessible for all, not uh, depending on where you live or how much you earn or gender or ethnicity, but accessible for everyone. Uh, it's also a tax-based system, which has a few implications. Uh, the government spending as a share of total health spending is about 85%, which is quite high. Um, we do have uh, uh, private uh, providers uh, within all of our countries, uh, as well as, of course, public uh, healthcare providers. But even the most or almost all private providers are part of the tax funded system. And that means that uh, the public sector has a lot of, uh, to say when it comes to, to the healthcare provision. The private providers have to uh, abide by the same rules as the public providers. And being a tax-based system, we also focus a lot on cost efficiency of getting as much quality as possible for the money. And uh, this means that we have to also to have a um, uh, well, evidence-based healthcare. We have to know that what we do in the healthcare sector actually works. Um, we have uh, some common challenges and also opportunities. So the demographic development is probably the, the most, well, obvious one with the, the aging populations that we do have. Uh, that's of course very positive that we uh, all reach or on average reach a high age, but uh, it's also very costly. And we are an ur or urban societies, but there are still people living in the countryside and we cannot forget about them. Um, we also see changed expectations. Everyone expects to live longer, to live healthier and be more active well into old age. Uh, and we would not accept to, to say that, okay, you're old, so you cannot, uh, you will not be able to move around, for example. Uh, and uh, we also demand more of healthcare in general. And we want a seamless experience. It should be maybe well, not as going to the movies, but at least it should be rather pleasant experience. Uh, and this, of course, has to do with the medical advancements that we see uh, with uh, physician medicine, for example, that will be able to, to treat uh, well, complex uh, diseases on an individual basis. And that, of course, will mean that it, it will be more effective, but it can also be more uh, expensive if you have to develop a, a pill that works for for just one individual the development cost of that pharmaceutical will be quite high uh, and then we have the new technologies the all these abbreviations you know g5 uh, it ict um, ai and iot and these have already started to to affect the way we provide and deliver care and uh, hopefully it will be, become more effective and, uh, and uh, at a lesser cost. Okay, so also a few words about, uh, well, the sustainability of healthcare in the Nordics. Here we also see some common characteristics and I think a lot of people today have already mentioned uh, these uh, aspects. So I will go through them maybe. Briefly, first of all, we have a focus on prevention and local care. Uh, and all of the things I'm saying, I'm not saying that it's perfect, but at least compared with many other countries, uh, this is the way, uh, well, other countries see us anyway. So prevention, of course, is better than curing. Uh, and it also has a, well, if you don't fall ill, of course, uh, the healthcare you don't have to uh, to get uh, will not have an impact on the environment, for example. And uh, we have many years of working with the preventive measures to to um, reduce uh, smoking, alcohol use, to reduce traffic accidents, and so on. But we also have secondary prevention, like you should to well to try that people stop smoking before having a major surgery because that will improve the outcomes of that surgery. Um, we also want health services when you actually need them to be, um, to be as 
close to the patient as possible, local care, primary care, and uh, digitalized care or online consultations as well. And primary care, of course, has less impact on the environment than the more specialized and advanced hospital care. And this uh, way of trying to push care to the to the primary level or to the more local levels will uh, change the role of hospitals also. So uh, if you talk to other countries, uh, they are very excited about building new hospitals and they brag about how many beds there will be. Well, we brag about how few beds our hospitals, our new hospitals have. Okay, it's a, a matter of size and how many patients you have in your catchment area, of course, but we don't want people to be in the hospital if they don't, well, strictly have to. Uh, we want to reduce the number of nights in, spent in hospital. We want to reduce readmissions and we want to, to push care, um, even, for example, chronic uh, care chronic management uh, to the lower levels. And we also focus a lot on person-centered care to involve the patient in the care because that will lead to better outcomes and to reduced overconsumption of care. And uh, I know that the previous speaker said that uh, it's difficult with a holistic view and uh, that there are silos within uh, hospitals and, uh, and uh, management, but uh, Overall, we still have an, a holistic view. We don't look at just one aspect of uh, the sustainability issues. We look at uh, all the environmental ones, energy, water, waste handling, food, transport, pharmaceuticals, which I think we saw earlier has a great impact. Uh, so it's important to look at it from, from the beginning, from production and all the way up to, to waste handling. And uh, social sustainability, of course. Uh, is of course also important and I think all or most uh, large hospitals in the Nordic uh, are environmentally certified through the ISO uh, organization and I also wanted to comment on the healing environment uh, that uh, how the healthcare facilities are designed also affects the um, uh, the healing and the, the outcomes of care so that's another important aspect. Um, synergies with the surrounding society. First of all, we love nature. We go by bike as we saw in Copenhagen, but also um, in Stockholm. And I think it's even more um, uh, popular now with the Corona situation. Uh, the bike lanes are quite crowded. Um, so yeah. We try to design cities that promote uh, healthy living. And the healthcare buildings are also well, well integrated into the systems that are in place in the city and in the community. For example, district heating and cooling, wastewater, uh, waste and water treatment, and uh, making sure that uh, healthcare is accessible through public transport. And for example, in uh, Uppsala region, uh, you can uh, apply to get uh, a refund for the ticket uh, or the transport cost if you have used public transports. And uh, as also mentioned, the SDGs are important for the, the cities and the communities and as also for the hospitals. So it's, it's an ecosystem, I would say. Um, focus on innovation. And uh, I think uh, the Nordic countries, uh, they, they do well in, in rankings uh, when it comes to most innovative countries. And uh, that is also actually true for the healthcare sector. So most uh, hospitals have innovation departments and innovation um, uh, coordinators, where, for example, through TED test beds, um, uh, private uh, sector can uh, test their products in the healthcare setting and to understand how they work and what implication it has for uh, effectiveness of care, but also for sustainability. Um, we mentioned that uh, healthcare is, uh, is um, well, provided by the, or financed by the public sector to a large extent. So public procurement becomes very important in shaping the, what materials and what products and services will be used in the care sector. So we have innovative and green procurement. 
and for example in uh, in Sweden we have the public uh, no the innovation um, procurement agency and they um, have uh, these uh, cut and paste uh, criteria for different uh, categories of products so that uh, a hospital wanting to uh, or a region wanting to uh, procure um, for example uh, uh, gloves can just uh, copy those uh, criteria into their tender documents and they don't have to develop all the expertise themselves. Uh, and then uh, innovative pro procurement is uh, done when uh, the healthcare and the supplier or suppliers develop uh, innovative products. I think one good example here is um, pro an EU funded project uh, coordinated by Karolinska Hospital where um, some uh, packaging companies in the Nordics uh, co uh, cooperate to develop a PVC-free uh, bag for uh, a blood bag. Uh, so that's interesting. And there are other examples as well. Um, also, when it comes to, um, well, innovation from companies, from suppliers, of course, we have so many interesting uh, solutions there but i don't think i have the time to mention many but uh, we have when it well when it comes to packaging materials when it comes to um, making sure that the cold cold chain for pharmaceuticals is kept uh, for reducing uh, waste uh, handling and yeah there are a lot of of different um, um, innovations in this area uh, and then also sustainable hospital buildings, both when it comes to refurbishing old ones and building new, building green uh, buildings. And in Sweden, we have uh, the um, uh, environmental construction or milieu big nad, which is a little bit more difficult for hospitals to achieve because uh, there are so many uh, processes affecting the environment. But uh, we see now that uh, several of the hospitals that have added new uh, uh, buildings uh, actually make the gold standard so that's quite uh, quite uh, good and uh, again the healing architecture where uh, Nordic uh, architectural firms are changing to an evidence-based design that is promoting the healing process of, of patients and then last uh, sustainable healthcare organizations uh, where I think uh, even though, um, uh, as we heard from Copenhagen, it's a problem, but at least the, I think the, the examples that were given showed that the whole organization is involved in, in uh, moving towards a more sustainable healthcare. It has to do with public procurement, it has to do with the certification, eco-labeling, ISO and sustainability reporting. It has to do with the management engagement, where it's really important that management, uh, well, sets the tone. But we can also see that the staff promotes uh, and takes the initiative to be more uh, sustainable. And connecting again to the opportunities that we have, the digitalization that we see is really increasing now will probably lead to to more effective healthcare, to, to less impact on the environment. So now we know that we have a really good and sustainable healthcare in the Nordics, and now we should start spreading these good solutions. So how can we do that? I think we should start with operating between the Nordic countries. Uh, we are small, so we cannot uh, perhaps uh, offer um, uh, system solutions covering all the needs. We, but if we cooperate, we can fill in the gaps and, um, and uh, well, work together to package for exports to offer uh, system solutions. And we can do this by showcasing it through delegations to other countries, by receiving incoming delegations. Uh, I also like the idea that um, the Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare uh, has uh, with um, uh, this Grand, Grand Chapingo. Uh, a mix of, of uh, the best from the Nordic uh, countries that could be demonstrated digitally and uh, perhaps also live and to disseminate the knowledge that we have through white papers and seminars and so on. And um, I think that if we 
do advocacy jointly, then we can actually uh, contribute to putting sustainable healthcare on the agenda. So, um, yeah, I think we need to do that together. So here are my contact details and uh, don't hesitate to contact me if you have an idea or if you well, want to discuss this further. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to wait just a couple of minutes uh, and give uh, participants a chance to maybe write a question in the chat, uh, if you have one. So just a couple of minutes. Yeah, or yeah, let's continue the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, if you have any questions uh, towards Anna, you can also message her directly in deal room after the session. Mm -hmm. So I would like to present our final speaker of today, which is uh, Daniel Eriksson. He's the founder and director of Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare. Welcome. So thank you very much. Uh, some of you saw me this morning giving a short presentation about Nordic Center and the conference. Uh, um, so the first slides here might be a bit of a repetition for those who has just signed in later on today. As Felicia said, my name is Daniel Eriksson. I'm the, one of the founders of the Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare. I've been working with sustainable healthcare for many, many years now in different constellations. Uh, Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare is a network hosted by a, an organization called TEM. It's a foundation, self-funded foundation since 1984. We're working, working from locally in Skåne to international. We're self-funded, non-for-profit and independent uh, 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 foundation. Uh, so we're not linked to any, any government agency or region or so. Uh, we do fund ourselves through, through R&D projects in different ways and trading and networks and even uh, also some consulting for, for national and international organizations. Uh, we have another network besides Nordic Center for, for Sustainable Healthcare called CSOR Skåne. Uh, with, uh, I think, 105 members or so. Some of them are uh, quite, quite uh, international, well-known. Uh, but here today, I will talk about Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare that we started actually five years ago uh, this year. So, so we, we, we are uh, uh, celebrating a five-year anniversary uh, this year. Uh, uh, um, and do check out our webpage, Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare, nordicshc.org, uh, to get uh, our newsletters and those kinds of things that are, uh, there's a lot of things happening within the last, uh, the next six months or one year ahead that you don't want to miss. Uh, Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare, we are around 115 members, uh, I think now, um, the latest number is. And uh, when we started this network, we were hoping five years ago, when we said, let's start it, we were hoping that someone from Denmark would join when we started this in Sweden, so we could call it Nordic. Uh, uh, but, but today we have members from, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 countries on four continents now. So it's... Um, 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 actually four continents that we have uh, members on. And that's, uh, we're very grateful for that. Uh, uh, and that also shows the interest and, and, uh, and uh, uh, all the dedicated organizations around the world about to collaborate with the Nordics within this uh, sustainable healthcare. Uh, the brief history of what we do, we've been working with sustainable healthcare since 2005. I started out as environmental coordinator at uh, one of the university hospitals here in Sweden. Uh, after that, I moved to TAM and we worked for many, many years with, uh, for many, many years, but for a few years with, with the export of clean tech aimed to, to, to uh, sustain healthcare in different ways. So we did different um, activities around uh, Europe and even in Asia and US, et cetera. Uh, this grew. Uh, we got so many contacts around the world and that we started to get to be on like an information hub. We got contacted by organizations and persons all over the world uh, looking for, for different answers about Nordic sustainable healthcare. Uh, uh, and then we decided we need to create something of this. We need to make an entity. Uh, so we, we approach different organizations in Sweden, government agencies, regions, etc. See how can we set up a, a center on sustainable healthcare here in, in, in Nordics. Uh, no one was very keen on the idea. 
but uh, but me and my colleague Johannes uh, in 2015 we said oh we we do it now we start it and hope that we we get some members. Uh, since we've been working with this for many years, we had some some members to start with, and uh, um, quite soon we got both a lot of members and and uh, 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 different projects, and that shows only the need for these kind of collaborations. Uh, since we started this without any initial funding at all, we still have grown now uh, for five years to become one one of uh, of uh, the international players within sustainable healthcare. So very grateful for that. And we also see, as Anna said before, that uh, that we, we we needed to do something on a larger scale than only in Sweden because Sweden is too small. We need to at least co collaborate in the Nordics or or even better Europe and global on these issues. Uh, we do believe that Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and we also used to say Netherlands are the front runners uh, within sustainable healthcare. Uh, but still, even if we are quite good, there are still things we need to learn from other countries and other health systems around the world. Uh, we, we focus on what we call sustainable healthcare. And um, uh, those of you who work in this field, you know, there, there is no, no real definition of what sustainable healthcare is. We, we define it like this. We, we define it as, as the building. It could be a hospital, it could be the primary care unit, but when you get sick, you get as uh, and sustainable treatment as possible. Uh, we try not to, to move too much into sustainable health, uh, not because it's not important, but mostly because others are doing that much better than we do. Uh, we try not to move too much into what we call environmental health because others are doing that much better than we do. Of course, these are interlinked with each other and we need to collaborate over these uh, silos or whatever you call it, but but uh, we focus on what we think we are good at, and that's uh, the definition you have here, have here in the middle. Uh, back in the days before uh, we started Nordic Center, I was um, working with a project with um, Denmark, uh, a region who would start and, uh, a few hospitals, and me and my colleague, then project manager colleague here in Denmark, we, we made this model on sustainable healthcare. How, how do we address uh, these issues? And this is a very simple model now, how to think ab about, about sustainability in the healthcare sector. Uh, we usually take like cell toxins, cancer treatment drugs as one of the, one of the examples. Uh, as you see in the circle, it's, uh, uh, cancer treatment is extremely ex uh, expensive. It can cost hundreds or maybe even thousands of euros a day for treatment. Uh, the sustainability point of view, is uh, that uh, uh, um, it's mutagenic and cancerogenic and the body can't uh, dissolve this uh, drug. So it goes with the urine and the wastewater treatment plants and we have difficulty cleaning that. Uh, so it's a, a big environmental impact for those kinds of drugs. Uh, if you look at the working environment, people working with cancer patients can themselves get health issues related to working with, with cancer patients and those very heavy drugs that, that uh, uh, surround those treatments. So, so it's very expensive, it's bad for the environment, and it's bad for the working stuff. So why do we then use it? Of course, for patients. And this is the big difference on working on sustainability in the healthcare sector compared to, to other industry. In most industries, if you had used something like cell toxins or cancer treatment drugs within uh, your facilities, it would have been forbidden since 1973. Uh, if you're looking at the car industry or telecom industry or, or any other industry. But in the health industry, you need some of those things for the patient's sake. And you can't get rid of it before you find something is equally good or better. Uh, but this means also we need to have that for patient safety. Then we need to do as good as possible for a working environment. We must have closed administrative system for those drugs we need to have. Fume hearts must take care of the waste so it doesn't um, get any substances in the air, etc. Uh, when it comes to sustainability, uh, we really need to take care of the waste. We must invent, you know, wastewater treatment plants that can take care of these drugs in the wastewater treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the economic factors we have to solve in different ways depending on the health system. Uh, so this means that you need to work with sustainability in a totally different way than you do in the rest of the industry. But this also means that there's room for innovations. In all these working environments, sustainability, and even the economic factors, there's enormous room for innovations, improvements, and, and companies in the long run also business, basically. 
So, so in that sense, it's much more interesting to work with sustainability in the healthcare sector than any other industry, I would say. We also think that we, we should focus on a larger part of the value chains when it comes to sustainable healthcare. Um, of course, the first one, if you see this as an onion you're peeling down, you have a reduced cost for healthcare itself. Okay, we save energy, we save money. That's good, of course. But we can link that to, to some of the things that Anna said, you know, test beds, uh, commercialization, innovation, getting new companies on the market. We can attract investments to those companies, get other hospitals and healthcare systems in the, in the world to come and visit us, and in the long run, get export and tax income for those companies. Then all of a sudden, uh, uh, the sustainability improvement in healthcare also drives a part of the economy that gives back tax to, to the healthcare industry. And all of a sudden, it's not only a cost, but it's also something that creates development and new innovations. We also think you need to look at the whole chain from research, um, you know, focusing on new, new solutions from, from university and, and, and other R&D organizations, uh, create those innovation, get a good home market, and then work on internationalization uh, to get the, the value out of sustainability in healthcare. So it's not just you know looking at the small segment that you're based in; it's looking at the bigger picture. In these cases, because we believe there are so many different solutions and good ideas and things that have happened in the Nordics and other countries that that aren't shared enough. Uh, there are small companies with fantastic innovations that uh, actually. Uh, should get uh, a larger market share in the world because they are, uh, are, are, are a part of you know, solving these issues or this environmental impact that healthcare has. And there are things that are fantastic that are happening but are not spread enough. Uh, uh, we are trying to do that. Some of the things that uh, Anna mentioned that you can do, we, we, we do those kinds of things um, uh, uh, already. This is one of the examples of the projects we're working on now with Swedish Energy Agency. And this conference is a small part of that. Uh, it's the internationalization of clusters. We run one of the innovation clusters in Sweden, trying to get the energy and climate smart solutions, uh, 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 both uh, improving the work in Sweden, but also getting, out the, uh, getting it uh, out on the international market and, and uh, collaborations. This is an example of a delegation we had uh, one year ago uh, to Canada. Um, 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 we, we went there with the Swedish company, Swedish hospital, to, to, to see how um, 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 the interest for, for the Nordics are in, in, in these um, in different markets. And it's, uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, uh, um, uh, there were a lot of people attending, and that small delegation actually turned into a larger conference because there were so many people who wanted to attend to listen to how we can collaborate between Canada and, and, and the Nordics within sustainable healthcare. And uh, hopefully a lot of things will come out of this uh, uh, delegation. Here's another example we had to, to Tel Aviv, um, where you have an um, equally high standard, you can say, on, on the medical part of, 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 uh, of the hospital, but there's uh, uh, some room for improvement on the environmental side and also you know, saving money on energy and so on. And here can exp ex uh, experiences from the Nordic can actually generate or lower the cost of healthcare care quite substantially in a, quite a short term uh, also. Uh, uh, here's another project that uh, um, uh, I mentioned before, uh, uh, um, a guideline to, to work with sustainability for within smaller and medium-sized uh, medtech and life science company uh, um, so they don't make mistakes when developing uh, products and services that, that they don't meet the, the demands we see in the future that the hospital will have. Uh, you need to have sustainability in consider consideration when you're developing something now as a small startup company within these sectors that maybe is on the market in five or ten years. Uh, what demand on sustainability would we have then? Um, uh, and you need to, to take that in consideration already now. This is another series we're working with now, Nordic Know How, very specific, uh, narrow uh, subjects, very hands-on with the technologies that are present in this uh, specific um, uh, area and the hospitals and regions that have that installed and how much they saved and how much it worked. This is an example on, on a nitrate oxide, nitrous oxide destruction. Um, um, we have a whole line of series that we will produce the, the next uh, years to come uh, just to showcase that there are very, very good solutions already on the market. 
so why are the Nordics front runners in sustainable healthcare? So Anna mentioned some of these, so so there will be some kind of overlap, but I will uh, went through it a bit faster, maybe a little bit a uh, little bit different perspective. Uh, we did, on behalf of the Nordic Innovation and a few partners, um, um, a white paper on Nordic sustainable healthcare, where we actually try to look into why are the Nordics front runners in this and, and what are characteristics uh, within this. And we found five uh, areas where where where, uh, where, the, where the explanation is why the Nordics are, are quite good at this. And and uh, uh, as Anna said, culture, politics, and and uh, and legislations. Uh, uh, we want to do the right thing. We have no relation to nature. We have a long history of working with sustainability in general in Nordics. We have hospitals in the for forefront that has a lot of systems at place. Have management system. Have organizations. Have um, use systems for reporting, etc. And 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 and. Um, systematic sustainability work, you can say, that is built into the management system. We also have this system solution. So a hospital being built in the Nordics, in most cases, will be pretty good just by being built in the Nordics because you're linked up to district heating, district cooling, natural recycling program, and biogas ejection, et cetera, et cetera. We have wastewater treatment plants within the municipalities. So just by being in the Nordics, you are quite good to begin with, uh, no matter what effort you have as a hospital. Uh, we have innovative companies uh, that are linked to this. Uh, it's not only uh, clean tech and, uh, and med tech or, or life science, but also construction company or mobility or ICT. Their companies are working uh, uh, with innovative solutions in collaboration with the healthcare system in different ways. Uh, and we have this holistic circular view. Uh, and and I, I usually say this uh, as a... Uh, uh, little catchphrase, but in the Nordics, we're a top 5% in everything, but we're probably not best in anything. And um, meaning that is, uh, if you're looking at each specific sustainability issue, there are always some hospital in the world that are going, you know, have green roofing on every roof and world leaders in green roofing, but might not be doing anything else within other uh, um, aspects of sustainability. So, so the meaning is that we, we, we are working on a very high level on all the issues, but we might not be the best in anything, but we're top 5% in everything. Uh, um, uh, as a part of that, we also work with the Nordic Ministry Council uh, as a Nordic Task Force for Health and Welfare Solution. And we, we, we are very happy that we have uh, succeeded <laughs> to get sustainable, innovative hospitals one of four prioritized areas within uh, the stronghold qualities of the Nordic health tech system. Uh, meaning that sustainable, sustainable, innovative hospitals will have a, 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 a a uh, more visible presence uh, in, in future projects in the Nordics, hopefully. Uh, uh, and as you see, the other ones are smart digital solutions, avian assistance, living care technology, and personalized care. Uh, 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 we are very happy about that. Uh, this is something that we think is very important to recognize that sustainable healthcare is one of the strongholds of the Nordic. So what do the, 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 the um, uh, uh, environmental managers of the Nordic hospitals think is most important to work on? This is a survey we did a few months ago, a few years ago, two years ago, I think. Look at this. And you see that the blue lines are the importance. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, and the highest one is reduction of pharmaceuticals in the environment. It's the number one issue. Uh, another one is procurement, supply chain, then it's climate, green building design, chemicals, materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as you can see, uh, all these are quite high. The lowest one is 6.1. So all issues are important to work with, except water, as you can see. But I think that's natural explanations that uh, in many parts of the Nordics, we don't have any lack of water. But as you can see, there are a difference in what issues we should work on, but uh, the general idea is that it's important to work with most of the uh, issues. You can look it down a little bit further. It's uh, how good you are today and what investments we'll do in the future, the, the, the orange and, and uh, gray uh, uh, staples. But uh, uh, you can send an email if you want more explanation on that. So next step on promoting, Anna mentioned it, we're trying to do uh, the world's greenest hospital in, in Grand um, uh built a virtual hospital with uh, sustainable hospital, uh, with sustainable solutions. Uh, we have made a little story about this and we will make the greenest hospital in the world. And we're trying to find out what are the best solutions within pharma, ICT, energy, materials, etc. 
And if you if you can't um, uh, if you you see this, this is a little word play word play with uh, 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 the Nordic languages. Uh, Grün Köpinkit, uh, as it's pronounced. Grün is the grün, as I say, is a Danish word for green with the Nordic letter er. If you add an N to the Danish grün, you get the Norwegian word for green. It's more called grün. It uh, sounds a little bit happier. And Shipping is a very common part of uh, Swedish city names. Ki, uh, you know, Helsinki, Finland, and also a, a, a part of the Finnish word for city, Kaupunki. And V is a letter used in Icelandic Faroe and Alfdalian. It was also used in the rest of Scandinavia during the Middle Ages. So, how much time do I have, Lisa? Okay, then I skip this and I move to, to the last slide and say thank you for your time. And if you have any questions or anything about what we're doing at the Nordic Center, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, very much. We are now running an overtime for this session. So uh, we, I'm just gonna go ahead and conclude uh, the session today. Uh, we are going to have a, a little wrap up after this session if you want to join. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>